Good evening, Twitch. Hello, viewers on YouTube. Welcome to Birth of a World. A few notifications before we start tonight's stream. Uh, there's going to be some slight changes coming up uh, for Birth of the World series. First off, instead of hosting the session notes on my blog, where I take weeks and weeks before I actually post them, I'm now going to be doing the session notes in Google Docs here, which means that both for today's session and for future sessions coming forward, people will be able to read the docs uh, in real time even as I'm writing them if you want to follow along instead of watching the video, uh, as well as being able to quickly get to the docs uh, in the future. So there's going to be no more delay between when I actually write the notes for the session when I do the show and when you can actually read and download the notes. So they'll be available now. There's a link on Twitch um, in the related links section below the video. And on YouTube, there'll be a link to tonight's notes uh, below the video once this is posted up on YouTube. So with that out of the way, tonight's uh, topic is going to be creating a boss encounter. So if you recall, let me pull up actually the, um, the story that we're going with here. <clears throat> Uh, Pulling up the story that we're going with here. Oh yeah, for anyone new, um, this is an interactive podcast. Feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll try and answer them. Additionally, there'll be various points where I'm going to ask for suggestions. And so keep, keep your ears open what I'm talking about. And uh, if you've got a suggestion or an idea to make things better, feel free to throw it out and we can talk about what you're suggesting. So um, we're currently in adventure number three here, which is the players are traveling into Kazal, um, having left the kind of starter village. And they're going to start picking up on the main plot thread for their adventure. The main plot thread is that they accidentally activated a network of magic mirrors, uh, which cause, um, basically they activated one magic mirror, and that's going to activate all the rest of them. And while the mirrors are active, what it does is it makes uh, pieces of an other plane, a randomly chosen other plane, basically start seeping out of them into the world around them. So the terrain starts ch changing, Monsters start getting brought through, and so on and so on. And the longer they're open, the more pronounced this effect becomes. So they've just opened one of these. Um, and we're going to be encountering actually the first one that they have to deal with in uh, the adventure that we're detailing here for adventure number three. So we talked about how, what are they, what's going to come through. And we decided that it's going to actually be a portal to uh, otherwise good aligned plane. Um, and an angel is going to come through. Uh, from the other plane, and the players will have to battle with it. And during their battle with the angel, um, they will receive a psychic message from the angel, because angels have telepathy, um, that is a few clear images and some fuzzy ones detailing the events of a dark future. And I'll probably do another video uh, when I get back after Christmas break about kind of prophecies, uh, and we can come up with what exactly these images are going to be. But let's talk about just this angel. So... Um, it seems kind of odd that for a good aligned party, you would have an angel as something that they have to fight, or an angel um, terrorizing a township. So we've kind of decided a few sessions ago now that uh, the mirrors, when they pull you through, um, beings coming through basically go crazy uh, and will attack uh, when they would otherwise be peaceful or beneficial. So regardless of the creature's alignment, it's gone insane, um, and is going after everything in sight. So for this session, for this um, encounter, it's going to be a lone, a lone angel attacking the p village of Nassar. The village of Nassar is a village, uh, it's an oasis village in the desert, not far from uh, Vrasta, which is where the party get off the train, basically uh, having arrived in Karnast. So they'll, let, they'll arrive in Vrasta, they'll explore the city for a bit, uh, they might pick up a side quest or something in that city, and then they're going to get this news of an angel attacking people in Nassar, uh, and offering the reward for the live capture, if possible, of the angel, uh, to help figure out what the hell is going on. So that's kind of, and this is going to be what introduces our main uh, drama, our main plot thread here of the creatures coming through and all this stuff. So we are going to have to design an encounter for this angel. Now an angel, especially because it's probably just going to be a singular one, really lends itself to being a boss encounter. Angels are iconic creatures, right? They're you know, creatures of real world mythology. Uh, they're typically quite powerful. Uh, and as foes, they can be quite dangerous, especially if you're evil aligned. Um, our party likely won't be evil aligned. 
but they still have this powerful and psychotic creature to deal with. So that's kind of the framing that we're going with. Since it's going to be a single enemy encounter, this is basically going to be by default now a boss encounter. Uh, there's likely not going to be much of a lead up to the actual fight. They're going to basically arrive in Nassar and they'll see this angel uh, swooping overhead and doing horrible things and stuff like that. So I've gone ahead and pulled the lowest class of angel, the Deva, um, from the monster manual for 5th edition. Uh, we'll, be doing, we'll be planning this encounter out assuming the 5th edition rule set. Although if you would like to run us with a different rule set, uh, well, conversion is left as an exercise to the reader. So here's the stat block, and you can see already we've got a bit of a problem here. Our party is going to be level 6 when they get here, and this is a challenge 10 monster. It is much too potent, much too uh, spicy, shall we say, uh, for the party to actually stand against. And I realize I may be missing a section from its stat block, because... Yes, I did not write down its weapons. My apologies, I did not write down the angel's weapons for its stat block. So I'm just going to get those copied out quickly here. <clears throat> uh, so, ba -ba 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 -ba, let's see. This is, the, this is why we're doing this live, because sometimes stuff happens. Okay. So while, uh, while I'm typing this out, chat, how about any idea, any suggestions for ways we can uh, tone this guy down a bit? Uh, I'm going to give you a hint. We're going to have to deal with the environment and probably uh, what kind of effects would come being ripped through a portal and made crazy have uh, physiologically. Any suggestions for what uh, being ripped through the portal might do to a creature? Any creature, even, not just this one angel that we're talking about here. Uh, the effects of being pulled through by the magic mirror are going to have to be consistent uh, throughout the campaign, most likely. So we'll want to uh, have something that scales well and uh, isn't too game-breaking. Not much, act not much going on in chat tonight. Oh well, that's fine. Uh... And then it's got um... healing touch, which we probably don't need to worry about. Ah. Sorry, I accidentally hit paste there, so I was adjusting the. Um channel description before the show tonight and change shape which we're probably also not going to need to worry about um, basically it can disguise itself as other humanoids and it can heal things but it's not going to be doing either of these two things uh, during our encounter so I think we're just going to drop those two abilities right now uh, what else do we need to do so party is level six we need to bring this thing's challenge rating down to probably about seven or so. Uh, if anyone doesn't have it already, I highly, highly recommend the uh, DMG for 5th edition. It is actually a really good book just for uh, general DMing as, as well as specific rules for 5th edition. Um, it has a lot of information about 
uh, kind of building worlds and building storyline uh, if you prefer ingesting it in text rather than listening to me. Although I would definitely like it if you still kept coming and listening to me. Um, I think this is a nice thing we've got going on here with the collaboration with chat. Um, but we'll see. Uh, so we are looking at for something more like so for more like a challenge rating 10 for a hard encounter because they want it to be at least a hard encounter. Um, our target XP is going to be uh, 1100 for a seventh level hard encounter. So, or wait, sorry, that's not right. Sorry, my bad. Party is level six. We've got four, four members. Uh, so I'm still getting used to the tables here. So for a hard encounter, for a sixth level character, it's 900 XP per character. Um, just going off the tables here in the DMG. Uh, so that would be 900 times four, which is going to be, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I can math, really I can, uh, 3,600. So as you can see, we're a good uh, 2,300 XP over budget here on our Deva. So we're gonna have to start pairing it back its abilities to scale it down um, to be suitable for our encounter as a boss monster that won't just immediately annihilate the party. Like this, this like the, the damage twice per round, this is gonna hurt so, so bad uh, if they have to deal with that. Um, plus the thing flies, it's fast, it's got all these resistances. Let's start, uh, let's start cutting some stuff. So I'm gonna drop the magic resistance right off the bat. Um, uh, minus. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that coming through the portal right off the bat costs it its uh, spellcasting abilities, so both healing and its innate spellcasting. Um, and what did we just drop also? Sorry. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, and lose its magic resistance. So that's a start right there. So we, losing the magic resistance is going to drop its challenge rating considerably already. Uh, let's see if we have a good indicator here. There is a section on building monsters, which I have to look up quickly, since basically we are building a single monster as part of a single monster encounter. Still getting used to the new DMG, but I do really like the way it's structured and the way it works. Uh, da, 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 da. 273 for anyone playing the home game, we're on page 273. Looking at the building up a monster quickly here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. So, experience points by challenge rating. Uh, ba, ba. So yeah, we're coming in about, but we're coming in at 3,600 XP. We're looking for a challenge rating uh, between seven, and eight, between seven and eight, or between, sorry, what did I say? Between 3,600, we're looking at a challenge rating between eight and nine. So uh, that kind of gives us an idea of what to go off with. Oh, we have some suggestions from the chat. Uh, hopefully, chat isn't lagging too badly here. Uh, perhaps the travel could have crippled it physically, setting the fight in an area with lots of dynamics and cover, but leaving the ability, possibility to do high damage would force the players to play defensively. I have a hot-headed group of players is always looking for ways to slow down gameplay. Bread roller, I think you have an excellent notion there. So um, let's talk a bit about uh, how the terrain is going to play into this. I do like the idea of an extremely hard-hitting monster uh, being able to just basically, that could just, so the monster's going to land one hit on the party, hopefully on the tank. That tank is going to go crumple a little bit, um, and then the party will have to learn how to use their terrain to their advantage. Now, the Deva um, has the ability to fly with a speed of 90 feet, which means it can move three, t it can move one and a half times or three times faster than a player character can, um, potentially. Which, because um, because fifth ed lets you now break up your movement um, with attacks, it can basically swoop in, hit either one character twice or hit two characters while swooping through the party and get out of reach again such that the part such that the player characters could not even be able to chase it down um, because at sixth level they probably won't have flying they might I'd have to double check the um, player's handbook to see if they'll actually have access to flying 
But the idea is this is a thing you don't want to get close to you. It's going to basically fly around the arena. Um, so let's, let's start making some notes here. So, so the Deva. So by the arena, what are we talking about for the arena, actually? Uh, so it's going to fly around making hit-and-run attacks. So what's, what do we mean by the arena? Well, the, when you think about a boss encounter, it's basically always going to take place uh, in a kind of a, ro a room where there's space for both the boss and the player characters to maneuver. Um, cover to protect against ranged attacks or to help uh, with the kind of positioning of the fight. I should write these things down. So an arena has space, cover. Uh, let's see, what else, do we, what else do we need for a boss arena? We need space, we need cover, we need perhaps some obstacles. Kind of the... Um, going along with it, basically, they're all parts of the terrain. So what does it mean? What does it mean? So we're going to have... In this case, this is taking place in the city of Nassar, right? Uh, which we established previously as kind of a small oasis town out in the desert. So there's uh, buildings that are, there's underground buildings and, door and doorways set into the ground. I can spell, really I can spell. Um, the underground buildings with doorways set into the alcoves. Uh, we might have uh, shaded places. Um, places to tie up animals. Uh, things like that. Picture, picture your, your, your kind of tropey, tropey um, sandy desert town, right? Uh, you know, you've got kind of a bunch of sandstone buildings uh, baking slowly in the, in the hot midday sun while everyone hides in the canteen, uh, which is half underground, and uh, the liquor flows freely. That's kind of the town we're going with here. Uh, we mentioned that there's traders in the area, but uh, we're, not, we're going to assume that they're basically mining their own, or they've fled this attack rather than standing to fight or help the party. So the party are basically on their, going to be on their own defending this town in the uh, heat of a desert day. Um, or possibly at an evening, honestly. It doesn't matter what time of day this fight's taking place, I don't think. So this gives us some elements of cover here, right? They can kind of get into little niches in the ground, um, doorways, uh, to protect themselves, right? To be shielded from uh, this attack and basically have, like, a wall to their back. Uh, at the same time, so we have a highly mobile uh, enemy... Um, that uh, it's very good. We picked uh, so. Hold on, uh, Bread Roller is asking here: Is the mirror nearby the city? If the mirror changes the makeup of the area, looks like the city would be different near the mirror. That's an excellent point, uh, Bread Roller. Uh, in addition to, uh, in addition to the area kind of in the center of town, we're also going to have a. Uh, on the edge of town, so we said this is an effect that started everywhere uh, when the first mirror was touched, when the first mirror was activated during Adventure 2. And now we're uh, starting to see its seeping effect, but it won't have spread very far yet. So I'm thinking perhaps just the area around a building or a storage house. So we've got the storehouse maybe where the magic mirror was being kept. A lot of the, a lot of the, the thing we're going for here is kind of these mirrors are forgotten artifacts uh, until they actually get activated. Um, so it's been, it's, it's in a singing storehouse somewhere, and the mirror's effect is starting to overlay a piece of a good aligned plane. So the players will probably see this. Actually. 
Uh, so the players can see this from the middle of town. Uh, this area. Uh, let's say, let's do the whole like floating kind of piece. Float. I, I, I'm picturing like the floating marble kind of uh, uh, heaven-like trope, right? Uh, Um, so it's going to be, uh, there's going to be stuff floating in the air that you can kind of hide underneath um, to avoid kind of uh, being swooped down upon, as well as places to stand if your tank is feeling incredibly reckless and wants to try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a flying angel wielding a uh, radiant damage dealing mace. Uh, but it's inviting. It's inviting, right? It says, it, the, the players will see this and they're just like, oh, we can go over here and the stuff will be better. Uh, I like that suggestion, Bread Roller. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, so where? Oh, this is going to get annoying. Can I turn off print layout? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I'm getting used to the change of format with Google Docs. Uh, so let's see. Um, at the other channel, we got the. So we've got that detail. Uh, we're not going to map the town out tonight, probably, but I'll, I will draw a map. Um, or if you want to run this theater of the mind style, then you don't need a map. You can just descri describe these elements. Um, but yeah, you have a highly mobile enemy with a melee attack. Um, So you're going to want the uh, tank, to obviously, to be positioned right alongside uh, when you're fighting this thing. I'm going to slow down and back up for a second. So when we're designing a boss encounter, what we're really designing is a uh, sort of a skill challenge. Uh -huh. Let's let's back up. I feel like we're getting kind of I'm getting kind of ahead of myself here. Um. So let's talk about just boss encounters in general first. We've got, uh, so we talked about the one fundamental for a boss encounter we need to have is an arena, which is space, cover, obstacles. Uh, space, cover, obstacles. What these really are, they're designing opportunities for players to do awesome stuff when they're faced with this uh, challenge, right? There are, uh, so we're gonna have these floating blocks up in the air so that if the, uh, if the barbarian or someone wants to try and like leap onto this flying angel as he swoops by or stand up there and challenge him and I'm waving my arms in the air here, but just challenge him and just like, come at me bro kind of thing, you know? Uh, maybe to lure the angel into an ambush type attack with, you know, the party's rogue hiding behind a pillar ready to sneak attack and uh, prepared lightning bolt or something like that to cook this goose. Um, something like that, right? Opportunities for the players to think creatively. That's what the arena provides. Um, the other thing, the other part of this is tactics. Uh, which is to say, the things that the player characters are doing turn by turn to help whittle this boss down. Um, but also the boss's tactics, right? We've said that this creature, is, that the Dave has been driven mad, so he's probably not going to be thinking very strategically. He's just going to be basically dive bombing things and attacking them. So, uh, I'm not sure I know that. I'm not going to say dive bombing because that would just be face planting into the dust. Um, so we talk about the Deva not thinking clearly and swooping and attacking. That means it can be tricked, right? Uh, the party were asked to capture it alive if possible, so maybe you can lure it into a net or something like that rather than having to kill it outright. <coughs> um, things like that. And the, again, the, the layout of the arena is really important to kind of 
suggest to the players uh, possibilities that they could use. So, um, whereas I was thinking more of like luring it into an underground building so it would be less likely to be able to fly away, uh, you could just as easily bring it to kind of uh, this area that's been affected by the celestial plane and rope it in. Um, but when designing a boss fight, you also have to consider the player tactics. So. Uh, so we have our monster tactics, and we have our player tactics, uh, which depends on the group, right? <coughs> so take, for example, let's say we've got a fighter who's, you know, role-playing as someone who's incredibly reckless and violent. Well, then it makes perfect sense to make them want to, you know, climb up on a building and leap onto this, try and grab this guy out of the air and tackle him to the ground and start punching him or stuff like that. Uh, or um, we can talk, or we can talk about uh, the kind of the, the mage who wants to, you know, hide in a corner, flinging magic missiles and stuff like that. It all depends on the player tactics, but we can kind of encourage this and try when we're designing a boss encounter, we have to kind of think about the uh, components of it. Uh, I'm going to write down a couple of kinds of challenges that you can have, uh, different kind of pieces of challenge that you can put into a boss encounter. Um, so here's just a few I can think of just by like drawing from my ex extensive experience writing World of Warcraft um, back in college. <laughs> Uh, way, ways you can add ways you add challenge to a boss encounter because a boss encounter is special. If chat wants to suggest other ways to add challenge, please uh, shout them out because I think this is good to kind of make a list here. Um, for anyone just joining us, this is a totally an interactive podcast, and you are encouraged to ask questions, shout out suggestions, uh, talk to other people in chat, and we're going to together here teamwork and make a much better thing than I could come up with just sitting here on my own in the dark. Um, so adding challenge. So one thing you can do is things like the environment. This is like the classic stay out of the fire or maybe uh, the rising lava kind of boss uh, encounter, right? You have to, you know, beat him because the, there is some component of the environment that is hostile to you and going to beat you if you don't beat the boss and get out quickly. Heavy hitter is what we're actually going with here, where we've got a boss that if you try and just stand and fight it, he is going to crush your tank and kill the whole party. Um, Right, we're dealing with something that's going to deal, you know, uh, da, 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 25 damage twice, potentially, per turn. We're probably going to have to actually cool this down a bit. But let's say for now, right, that we've got this dealing here. That's going to murder a party of level 6 characters really, really fast. Uh, so they're going to really want to be vested after that first hit lands and they see how much damage it does. They are going to be really vested in not having a second hit land. Um, and so that's kind of a way of making a chat, making a boss fight challenging. Another way is to say a puzzle boss. These are bosses that say have lots of immunities or uh, are somehow connected to the uh, the arena or the train in some way. Um, uh, that ties nicely in where you have to do something other than just doing damage in order to beat the boss. This is like um, killing the Hydra by burning its necks with by cutting its heads off and then burning it with fire. Right? It's kind of an, it exists even in mythology. Um, alternate wind conditions, that's another thing we're actually pushing for with this encounter, is we ask to be able to capture the angel alive. And if they can, uh, they'll be richly rewarded uh, by the people who sent them on this quest. Uh, as a result, um, that alternate wind condition is very enticing, and so the players may wish to uh, take down the extra challenge rather than just fighting the thing of actually trying to capture it by you know luring it into a net or cornering it or doing something putting it to sleep I don't even know um, to win it that way rather than just dropping its HP to zero which would be the traditional win condition uh, any other win condition suggestions from the chat guys don't be quiet now um, another way to add challenge is to have them to do something other than just fight the boss maybe they've got an NPC to protect um, 
Uh, maybe they've got an NPC to protect, or maybe they're trying to... They don't actually trying to kill the boss, they're just trying to grab something from the boss's arena and GTFO as fast as they can. Uh, Red Roller goes on to say in chat here, bosses you don't actually fight are fun. I had a boss in one of my campaigns that was a psycho mass murdering dance floor. Dance floor? That would kill you if you were a bad dancer. Red Roller, I would love to be in one of your games, because that sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> mass murdering dance... So that's another thing, right, is you can have it, you know... In that case, the environment, the, the boss is an animate piece of the environment, and uh, uh, skill requirement, I'm going to call that one, right? Be a good dancer, or you get murdered by the dance floor. That's fascinating. Um, lastly, last key point of a boss encounter is, of course, the payoff, right? This is the Dragon Horde, or the, you know, final objective. I feel like th this kind of goes without saying, but I'm, I'm just going to throw it out here anyway. Um, you have a boss fight, you want to have some kind of, even if this is like more of a mini boss in the middle of an adventure, you want to have some sizable intermediate reward there, um, some sizable reward that you get right after being the boss. Because it says, okay, you know, you beat the boss and you get to breathe. You get to, you know, lick your wounds and sample the fine treasures that you've collected. Um, so, you, so a boss will always have um, good loot. Now, one thing that I want to point out for a boss encounter, a lot of enemies are kind of written with stats such that they uh, make a good, um, make a good fight, but not necessarily a boss fight. What makes a boss fight? I'm going to put this in here too, actually. Um, and w one thing that you need for a boss fight is epicness. I'm putting that in quotes because I don't think that's a real word. Um, if you look at a stat block for basically any enemy from the, from the Monster Manual, you're going to get the stats for a common member of that race that you'll encounter when the party level is at the level recommended for that enemy, right? Having it be, uh, having it be a few levels above will of course up the damage and may also give you something that has more defensive capabilities, but it might not have much lasting power still. Um, I'm gonna just nuke this because we're getting rid of that challenge rating 10. Uh, it might not have the kind of lasting power that truly builds an epic fight. So, uh, what, one thing that I tend to do is, uh, instead of taking the default HP here, pick something towards the higher end of that spectrum. Um, kind of set, a, set up the boss fight to have an unusually large pool of HP. So, um, you could probably bump this guy up to, you know, just give it a bit more, you know, 50 more points of health. Suddenly, that's a much longer fight. Uh, Right, suddenly the fight goes on for a few more rounds and it feels like it's got some meat to it. Because if you're fighting it as just an average kind of enemy, that fight's going to be over in a few rounds with a good party. Um, so this way, uh, the, even with a good party, the fight will last more than a few rounds. This is super important if you're doing an enemy who's at the party's challenge rating. Uh, so the other thing you want to do, um, so yeah, you want to boost it HP. So you might be wondering, um, you boost its HP, why can't we boost its defensive abilities so it takes da less damage per round? Um, the answer is because you want to make sure that your player characters can actually hurt the thing. Uh, there's often the case, there, there's often a case um, when you're dealing with a uh, creature that has high defenses that the fight just becomes frustrating because the player characters aren't actually denting the thing as fast as they'd like or as fast as they're used to. So by having a creature with high HP, or unusually high HP, while keeping its defensive stats well within range of what the party can actually hit, the party can tell that they're doing progress. Oh, thank you. I just got brought tea. I love that. Um, the party can feel like they're making progress, even though the fight goes on just as long as if you'd instead kept the HP the same and upped its damage reduction, things like that. Um, plus, the focus becomes less on how do we break its damage reduction and more on how do we just do as much DPS as we can, which I feel like is a necessary thing for a boss fight. Um, 
we want to say, so Bread Roller is saying aesthetics is another main pillar of boss fighting. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Bread Roller in chat goes on to say that uh, the killer dance floor was a conclusion to an adventure set in a big city uh, a la Las Vegas. Um, sometimes boss fights are weirdly meta and nobody wants to fight a red dragon in the middle of a wintry themed area. Sure, sure. So yeah, that's the idea too, right? You got the feel to it. To it. Um, boss fights generally have to feel special. Um, or has to be strange or exciting. So that kind of goes into kind of also, you know, um, this boss is harder, this boss hits harder, this boss has more, has a bigger reward. Uh, this boss takes place in a spot, in a location where I can use my abilities to the fullest. Um, it all plays together. It all plays together. And so you think of, uh, can people in chat, if you want to, name some real, name a boss fight, like from a video game, we'll say, from video game boss fights, uh, if you play video games, uh, that you found was really, really epic and amazing and tell me what you think what you think made it that amazing uh, we have bread rollers example from the dance floor <laughs> uh, that's right everyone anyone who's in chat feel free to uh, speak speak up and if you're not in chat feel free to log into twitch and join us here this is a dialogue I don't like just me talking alone into the microphone I think it's less exciting uh, while we pull the chat for suggestions of other boss fights that were amazing uh, and what made them good. Let's talk more about this Davif battle. Um, Lastly, um, one thing is that uh, destroying the mirror uh, will not... So the effects of the mirror uh, on the surrounding environment and on the creatures brought through are permanent. So someone, uh, some a crafty player will likely think to, oh, we can close the mirror and that will break the portal and hopefully unsummon this stuff. And they're welcome to do that, but it's going to be, eh, nope, no sell. You still have to beat this boss. Um, or take it captive. So, uh, let's see. So we're, we talked about how much damage this thing is deal, right? This deals 25 damage twice per round. Let me just, I want to pull up the DMG and see where 25 damage per round falls on the uh, average damage output, kind of, on, on the stat blocks here for challenge rating. Um... So on 50 damage per round, actually, huh, okay. So one thing I've noticed about 5th edition, I'm coming from a background of 3rd edition and Pathfinder primarily. Uh, one thing I've noticed about 5th edition is the damage and HP numbers seem to be a bit higher than they have been in other editions of D&D. And I'm still apparently adjusting my mind to it. Because we're actually just at the upper range of a CR7 monster uh, for offensive damage, for, da for straight up damage. We're at 50 damage per round, right? 25 damage twice um, because of the D7 plus 18 radiant. And that puts us, yeah, smack um, right at the high end of level 7, which is where we want to be for our boss fight. So that's cool. Um, its attack bonus is a bit higher, is a bit too high. Uh, maybe we want to do that a bit. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe knock it down its attack bonus a bit because it's being insane and reckless. Oh, bread roller, don't worry about stats. Any, anyone who's listening, do not worry about stats. I've got all the stats I need for 5th ed here, but I try and be as system agnostic as I can. It's just kind of hard to build an encounter without talking about what system you're using. So I'm building this for 5th ed, and I'm going to knock its attack bonus down uh, to a plus 7. So I'm just going to take it down one point. That still puts it above, uh, that puts it in challenge rating level 8. Um... Um, but we're going to say, uh, we're going to call this thing a challenge seven and, uh, 
make a note that it's challenge is seven ish because this is a boss fight. Um, not much coming from chat in the way of other boss fights that they thought was epic. I guess it's kind of a quiet night on Twitch. So be it. Um, so I think we're doing pretty good here. Let's look at some other th stats we might have to adjust. So uh, I'm just looking here if anyone's playing the home game. I'm at page 274 in the DMG that came out last week. It's a fantastic DMG. I think it's probably the best one Wizards has made. <clears throat> Wizards does not pay me for any of this. I actually think it's good. Um, uh, I'm not being, I'm not a promoter per se, but I do really love this, the way this DMG came out. I think it's much better than the previous one. Um, so we are looking for challenge rating seven, but we've got an AC of 17 right now, which puts it, that's more like, that's coming from challenge rating 10 is what that is. So we want to knock that armor class down a bit too. I think what I'm going to do is, uh, let's say, so I'm going to lower its stats is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say it's physically drain, it's physically weakened by being brought through here. Uh, so I'm going to say, so yeah, I'm going to lower this down to uh, 15. So remember, we want, remember we were talking about with boss fights, we don't want them to be harder to hit. We don't want them to be harder to hit than a monster the players are used to. We just want them to last longer. Uh, so I'm knocking its AC down to something that's more in range for a CR6 encounter, which is uh, 15. Um, uh, and we'll just say that its physical, its natural armor has been reduced by that. Uh, Bread roller, continue, bread roller. Uh, if anyone else is in chat, like Tice, if any of my regulars are on here, please feel free to sign up. I do like that uh, bread roller is being so contributing though, and I would love to have more people uh, speak up if you want to speak up. Um, let's see, so bread roller is saying that a, re a reckless creature may have a riskier damage range, uh, like just basically giving it a wider range. Uh, that's, I, I do kind of agree with you in principle, but I don't want to do that here because uh, the point, right, the whole, the part of the challenge of this encounter is how much damage it deals per round, right? And what, we want it to hit really hard, and we want to make sure that uh, a bad dice roll, especially early on, doesn't give the player the wrong impression. We want this guy to, you know, the first, the first round of combat, when the tank stands up and says, come at me, we want this guy to swoop in, bury his mace in the tank's face, uh, and send the, send the party reeling, and that sets up the actual, the, the core of the challenge for this fight is going to be dealing with its damage output um, by, you know, putting yourself in a position where you're not going to uh, be taking that kind of damage, uh, using defensive abilities, using terrain, using healing if you need to. Uh, it's, it should, this should really tr stress the party out uh, quite a bit here. Um, so we brought its attack bonus down, we brought its armor class down. Um, hit points are going to be... Yeah, well over, well over where we want for challenge rating seven, which is good because this is a boss. Um, one thing you can, one thing you can do, uh, DMs out there, of course, if you're finding that the party are chipping away this your boss monster's HP too quickly, is you can just you know have in your head roughly how long you want this boss fight to go on for. You know, um, have an idea of how much resources your players have, especially because this is basically going to be the only battle of this location. We want this to, you know, really burn the players out. So we can just always cheat a bit. We can just uh, cheat a bit by having it. Maybe, maybe we say its HP is more like 200 if the if they've chipped it down to half health, and it looks like it'll be over before uh, the players really start getting tired. We can always just say it lasts a bit longer, if you know what I mean. Or maybe it uses that healing ability that we decided to cut before from its original stat block to uh, regenerate some HP for itself, right? Uh, it's one, of the, it's one of those things you, you pick up pretty fast if you start DMing. I don't know how many uh, experienced DMs we've got listening or if it's newbies or players or what, but DMs cheat a lot. Uh, I'm just going to go out there and say it. DMs cheat a lot uh, in the interest of good storytelling, in the interest of interesting gameplay. Um, yeah, we cheat a lot because we, we're trying to make the game more exciting, right? The point is to have fun. And while kicking a monster's ass quickly certainly has fun, then the encounter is over and you have to carry on with the talky bits, which aren't always what people sign up for. So yes, um, if, I was, if I were running this at the table, I might cheat its HP total a bit if the party are doing too much damage. 
or I would look at what tactics I'm using for it, because remember, a key thing about boss fights here is not just the player, what the players are doing, but the boss tactics are a big part of how the encounter plays out. So if the boss is letting itself get hit too much, that's also a problem, and you need to kind of readjust and refresh your mindset, you know. This boss probably won't be hit all that much, because it's going for uh, uh, hit-and-run attacks. Another thing... Um, I think the non-magic weapons limitation is fine for a level 6 party. I kind of expect them to have plus 1 weapons by now. Um, but if you find your party doesn't have the necessary weapons to actually hurt this thing, kick that off. Kick that ability off. Get rid of it. Because um, it's just going to make your fight extremely frustrating. Being resistant to radiant damage makes perfect sense. Um, the condition immunities are still fine. We don't want people using charms, for instance, to take this thing down. I think that's kind of lame. Um, senses aren't going to matter, they are not relevant to this. The 120 feet telepathy is relevant for the story hook we put on here. Remember, this guy, while they're fighting him, or maybe when they capture him, is going to give the party all a vision of what will happen if they don't close the portals. But they'll have to take some time to interpret this vision uh, in a subsequent uh, session. But the, that telepathy is actually going to come in for gameplay purposes. Um... So let's see, what else do we need to do here? Uh, so yeah, we talked about cover, we talked about damage output. Uh, we talked about kind of the tactics it's going to do. Um, we talked about what we think the party will do for their tactics. So I think this is looking like a pretty solid boss encounter now. Um, I've still got a good 10 or so minutes left in this uh, in the show here tonight though. Um, Hmm. So let's talk about rewards. Uh, where, how are we going to reward the player characters for uh, finishing off this angel, or, or capturing this angel? Uh, so we talked about the authorities in Vasa um, offering a reward, and that reward's probably going to be a good chunk of change. Uh, one thing you can never underestimate uh, with a party is just how much gold they need to burn through to get themselves equipped and get... Uh, and be happy. Uh, I am notoriously stingy on loot. Um, so let's just make sure. Let's see here. This guy normally has... Oh, okay, whatever. Um, um, so we're going to give it full up loot for, loot for a monster of a challenge rating higher than it. Um, and where is that loot going to come from? Well, that's going to come from... That's not the, how I spelled that city. How did I spell that city? Vrasta, not Vasa. Vrasta. So there's going to be a bounty from the Vrasta authorities. Um, uh, we're, it's going to be mostly. It's going to be mostly in coin. Um, this creature was summoned, so it wouldn't normally have uh, items on it. Uh, let's see. If we were to have it drop something, if we were to have it drop an item, probably it's mace, uh, maybe like a, uh, uh, so it could be an excellent paladin weapon if you feel like, uh, <laughs> okay. Red Roller just says, hey, it would be hilarious if something got submitted in its PJs. Yes, yes, it would. That would be excellent. Um, if you have a paladin in your party, he, she, because we're going to be gender neutral here. Um, if you have a paladin in your party, obviously a, a, a uh, radiant or wholly aligned mace, a mace off of a deva, preferably one that you captured alive, uh, would be a beautiful paladin weapon with a story attached to it. Uh, um, so that could be a treasure of your party, basically, if you want to go that route. I recommend 
Uh, it might be a, might be a doable thing, right? If you've got a, whole, a good aligned cleric or a paladin in your party and you want to give them something fantastic, um, it could be a very valuable piece of loot, right? This is, you know, we could have a plus one or we could have like a... a uh, I'm not going to look up the, the magic the magic weapon stats right now, but you can give it like a, a wholly aligned, you know, something that something that will smite evil uh, more potently, uh, and that could be a really valuable weapon. Um, but yeah, mostly it's just going to be coin. Coin, we get its mace weapon, uh, and we get a plot coupon. What is a plot coupon? A plot coupon is simply something that you award your players with that they use to advance the story. Um, it's a TV trope. Look it up. In this case, it's the visions. Um. So let's see. Why did I do that? Um. Let's talk about the visions since we've got a bit of time here. Um, actually, no, that's going to get too, that's going to get too involved. I want to keep this kind of bottled in here. So that's going to be it for monster creation. Um, as always, this setting and all my notes on it and everything like that uh, is all usable under Creative Commons 4.0 attribution. However, the uh, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons stuff obviously is copyright of wizards. Um, I'm going to be going on Christmas break after tonight's stream, so there will be no stream uh, next week or the week following. I'll be back on the 7th of January, uh, and I'll be doing another creature creating one because I won't have done one in December. Um, so we're going to be doing creature creating. Um, these notes are available right now. If you're watching Twitch, just click the link under the video. Um, ditto YouTube. I'll put a link directly to the notes for this session uh, once the YouTube video is uploaded. Uh, please like, favorite, subscribe, do whatever, follow me on Twitter if you want to. Uh, and if you find yourself using any of the stuff I've made, uh, you do have to give me a credit. That's just the only condition of the license, basically, uh, is give me credit. And if you tweet at me, I will give a link to wherever you're using it, or generally give you a shout out here on the stream. So, good night, Twitch, good night, YouTube, and thank you, chat. You've been uh, a wonderful contributor here, Bread Roller, and to everyone else, a good night.